Hello, and welcome to Songs for the Struggling Artist, the blogcast. This is episode 298. My name is Emily Rainbow Davis. Thank you for listening to the blogcast. Today's blog is about something very silly. Uh, I got really obsessed with a computer in the movie of Tick, Tick, Boom. Uh, If you have not seen this movie, I believe it is available on Netflix, at least in the United States. And it is a movie about, well, it's based on a musical cabaret songs evening uh, by Jonathan Larson, who's the guy who wrote Rent. Um, And Lin-Manuel Miranda made this movie uh, of of the show. So, It's a sort of autobiography of Jonathan Larson, um, or biography. I don't know. What do you... Categories start to get funny. (laughs) You make a show about yourself, and then someone else makes a movie about that show. I guess it goes from autobiography to biography? Anyway, uh, I will tell you more about it in the blog post, but just wanted to give you the heads up, the, the... preview in case you wanted to watch the movie before I talk about it. (laughs) That would be silly. You don't need to do that. This is not full of spoilers, believe me. It's not like a movie that's like uh, real plotty. And by plotty, I mean P-L-O-T-T-Y. It's not full of plot. Anyway, why don't I read it to you? And then, then we can talk some more about it. It is called The Macintosh in Tick, Tick, Boom. In the first couple of minutes of the film, the character of famous theater writer Jonathan Larson introduces us to the year, a pan shot of a Calvin and Hobbes calendar that reveals it is January 1990 and a lot of his stuff. He tells us about his two keyboards, his music collection, and his Macintosh computer. My brain did a little record scratch of, huh, at this, but I had a movie to watch, so I watched it, occasionally squinting my eyes at his machine when he'd type a single word on that computer throughout the film. Then I went to bed, and I started thinking about that Macintosh computer. I thought about how odd it was for a struggling musical theater writer to own a computer at all in 1990, and how extra odd it would be if he had one that was new like that. I mean, I didn't know the exact dates, but I knew most people didn't start really getting these things for another couple of years. So this computer in his apartment in 1990 could mean only two things. One... Jonathan Larson was also a computer nerd in addition to being a musical theater nerd. And in 1990, this was just highly unlikely. Like, it's like a computer nerd and musical theater nerd could not have been the same person. They might meet at a party and make out, but those two circles of being were probably closed at the time. I knew both of those types of people then, and they were not the same. You could find one now, no problem. But in 1990, no way. So, given that this musical theater nerd was not likely to also be a computer nerd, the only other reason a man who cannot afford to pay his electric bill would have a fancy new computer was that his parents bought it for him. This would mean that his parents had some cash to burn. And the other evidence for the privilege his family must have returned to me as I went over some facts I learned from the film. His family lived in White Plains, a wealthy suburb of New York City, and they have a summer place on Rhode Island. This would mean that this composer cannot pay his electric bill, not because he has no access to money, but because, very likely, mostly others had taken care of those things for him before. Again, there is evidence for this in the film when it is suggested that his friend and former roommate, who had only recently moved out, used to take care of those things. Suddenly, a story about a struggling artist becomes the story of a man with a certain amount of privilege, carelessness, 
and entitlement. I have a feeling that this is not the myth the filmmakers wanted to make. Anyway, the next morning, I looked up when the Mac Classic came out because the two-second-long shots of it made me think it was like the computer in the 90s I knew best. I wanted to find out how weird a choice it would be for a musical theater guy to get a Mac. And when I saw that the Mac Classic came out in October of 1990, when the movie takes place in January of 1990, well, now I had a third explanation for how Jonathan Larson, a musical theater writer, had a Macintosh computer in his struggling artist apartment so many months before they came out. He's a time traveler. He went to the future, not super far, just far enough to pick up one of the first Macs, and brought it back to his present moment in January 1990. I'm sure he could have probably done some more useful stuff than picking up a computer a year before other people got them, but that's, like, a whole other movie. I sort of liked this explanation best, fantasist, that I am. But then I looked at the film again to grab a little screenshot of the computer, and it turns out the model in the film is not the Mac Classic, but the earlier, more expensive model, the Macintosh Plus. So... At least it's clear that this character is not a time traveler. Alas. But now I know that someone spent $2,599 on this computer in 1990 or before. And that's almost six grand in today dollars. This becomes an even more unlikely item for a struggling composer to have in his apartment. What is he using it for? Ain't no internet on that thing. He's not emailing his agent from it. He could be using Finale, the music software, which was invented in 1988. But if so, he's a really early adopter. Like, is a waiter at a diner likely to be using cutting-edge software to write his rock musical? In 1990? I'm gonna guess no. I know what those 90s Macs were like. It's not a thing you want to write a song on. Not in the early 90s, anyway. I can say that as a person who was starting to write songs at about that same time as I got my hands on a Mac. You can check my floppy disks. I didn't do my songwriting on the Mac. Based on the screens on the Mac in the film, he's not using any kind of music software. He's using that Mac as a word processor, just like I did at the time. He's using it to type your and your. This movie did not need a computer of any kind. Pen and paper would have done the same job. I'm trying like hell to understand why this Mac is in this movie. Like, was this in Larson's original show? Did he want us to know he had a Macintosh in 1990? If so, why? Well, I looked at the script for the 2001 version of this thing. This is the version that's available to the public. It's adapted by another playwright. And there's no mention of the Macintosh. It's possible that in earlier editions that the screenwriter had access to, Larson mentioned his computer. But I think it's most likely that the screenwriter made this call. The screenwriter, Stephen Levinson, writer of Dear Evan Hansen, was born the same year as the Macintosh, 1984. He has never known a Macless world. Perhaps he cannot imagine a world where someone could write a musical without one. So maybe he's added this Macintosh without realizing. It's understandable. It's just a mistake, then. That gave me a kind of peace. I thought I'd hit the bottom of this rabbit hole and just found a mistake. But then I happened to see some production research for Larson's apartment. And there is a photo of Larson's actual desk from the 90s. There is a computer on that desk. It's not a Macintosh Plus, though. It's not even clear that it's a Mac. But the actual person had a computer. It was not just added by a young contemporary screenwriter who hadn't done historical research. Emily, 
you seem really worked up about this tiny detail in a sweet little movie about a fellow struggling artist theater guy. What's your problem? Are you trying to get a job as an historian for films or something? Meanwhile, I know there are several among you who would like to know my thoughts about this film. I would like to know my thoughts about this film, but all I can focus on is that Macintosh and why they thought they needed it. Did Lin-Manuel Miranda get a Mac as a young theater dude? And he wrote his stuff on it, so it's, like, meaningful for him in tying his own legacy to the legacy of Jonathan Larson? I'm making stuff up here because that little Mac is just sitting in the middle of the whole experience for me. Did this movie give me some feelings I might be just funneling into this silly prop and I'm making a big deal of nothing? Possibly. Maybe I'm just reeling from some nostalgia for the period. Could be. But I also think that details like this are important because of all the side stories they tell that we, as storytellers, might not be aware that we are telling. Others might have seen a loving tribute of a biopic musical. I saw a confusing movie about a Macintosh. Oh, why do I care about this? I guess I know something about being a struggling theater artist. I've done it a long-ass time. The lesson he learns in the movie is that he should write what he knows, and the stuff he knows, I know too. Having watched the rise and fall of many struggling theater artists, my eye is pretty finely focused for spotting the secret advantage someone has. The reality is that this guy is not doing nearly as bad as the movie would like us to believe. Sure, he forgets to pay his electric bill, but he clearly has a financial safety net. He has the phone numbers for fancy famous people, and they take his calls. He has an agent, two keyboards, a mixer, a microphone, and I'm sure you haven't forgotten, a Macintosh computer. The actual person has, at the point that this play takes place, won an extremely prestigious award, though the film never mentions it. For a 29-year-old, he's actually doing amazing, like really super well. The film wants to make us think it's a super sad, struggling, difficult life. And from this struggling artist's perspective, his terrible life is actually as good as it gets for some folks. To see a film romanticizing the struggle made by a bunch of guys who are multimillionaires is just a little hard to swallow when their vision of the hard life is way better than my actual life. I mean, sure, I currently have a Macintosh computer, too. It's nicer than any computer Larson ever had his hands on. But that's because technology gets cheaper and better as time goes by. A Macintosh in 2022 means something very different than it did in 1990. We now live in a world where a computer is a necessity to do most any job, but particularly any job in freelancing arts. In Larson's time, it was still a rarity. You might find one in a family's house with parents trying to give their kids a leg up in the coming computer age. But struggling artists would mostly have had other priorities then. I'm still confused by the discrepancy in the computer from the research photo and the set they came up with. I watched a video interview with a set design team, and I gotta tell you, these folks cared about the details. They got the sag in the bookshelf. They searched for just the right model of Yamaha keyboard. Why would the computer be any different? I mean, these people got their hands on Larson's cassette tapes and they didn't put the actual tapes on the set. No, they scanned the covers so they wouldn't lose or damage his originals. They cared about getting his exact copy of Led Zeppelin IV. And maybe this is part of what gets under my skin about all this. Like, we all had that Led Zeppelin tape in 1990. I'm pretty sure I still have mine in a box in my mom's house somewhere. To watch a dude who is basically like a lot of people I know get canonized like this? Super disconcerting. 
I have known many musical theater writers more skilled than this guy who will never have their tapes lovingly scanned by a set decoration team. Nor would they like to, really. They'd just like to have gotten even a hint of some of the opportunities that Larson got, or to have started out with some of his privileges. Obviously, this Macintosh in the movie is standing in for more than just a computer. I know it. You know it. But I really do want to know what it's doing there. I learned so much about the history of Macintosh and Apple's Apple computers, what people were into. Uh, I, I had no idea how far down this rabbit hole I would go. And I went pretty far, I have to say. It did not all make it into this epic analysis of a Macintosh in a film. Uh, yeah. So, you know, if you ever want to talk about uh, 80s and 90s Macs, I, I may have something to contribute to that conversation, although I suspect by the time I talk to anyone about it, I will have forgotten everything. So let's try it, though, you know. <laughs> so today's song, what is going to happen here, you may be wondering. You probably are thinking, oh, probably something from Tick, Tick, Boom, given that it's kind of a musical. Uh, that would be a good guess, except for, nah, <laughs> it's not, I wasn't really interested. So. Here's what I here's here's what I'm going to give you. <laughs> I don't know how this occurred to me, but all of a sudden I was like, "Oh, this is about an Apple computer. I should sing, do you love an apple?" See, cuz it would seem that Jonathan Larson loved an apple or the screenwriter loved an apple or the director loved an apple. Uh I Sometimes, I don't know if I love an apple. I, uh, I tolerate an apple. I, I own an apple and uh, became an apple user just sort of by chance. Um, anyway, the song is called Do You Love an Apple? And uh, I'm going to sing it for you in just a moment and maybe tell you some more about it. Meanwhile, thank you so much for going down this rabbit hole with me. I, I know it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a rabbit hole that goes pretty, pretty far down. Um, if you like the podcast, I'm so glad. Thank you. Please tell someone about it if you get a chance. Um, if you would like to support it, that would be amazing. Uh, Patreon.com slash Emily R. Davis is the f- first port of call. There's also PayPal, Kofi. All those links are in the show notes. If you'd like to join in supporting uh, my audio drama, The Dragoning, we're trying to fundraise for season two. Uh, there are fundraisers on Kofi. There's GuideStar. There's uh, PayPal also. Company K- PayPal, different link. Um, those links are also in the show notes. So uh, thank you in advance for any support. Even just your ears right now are good. So thank you. Uh, And so more about this song. So it's, um, uh, I learned it from a band called Trapezoid, which was a folk band. I think actually they actually might still be active. But at the time that I heard this album, uh, the album came out in 1980, apparently. Um, I don't, I think it was quite a few years after that, though, that I, that I heard that album. Um, and uh, the, the singer of this song is a woman called Freda Epstein, who was my very first Alexander teacher. Uh, she taught me Alexander technique. And I think it may have been her singing on this song that made me agree to go study with her because she just blew me away. <laughs> I, I feel like my whole life people had been saying, oh, you have such a nice voice. And I was like, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> like, I just didn't, I didn't get it. And then I heard Freda sing and I was like, oh, if I could sing like her, like, oof, I, I, I feel like I could... I could justify all of those compliments that always before just felt kind of weird. Um, so, yeah, I studied with her in high school. 
She was an awesome human. Uh, unfortunately, died in a car accident um, many years ago at this point. Um, but, you know, you if you get a chance to listen to her, uh, I highly recommend it. There's this Trapezoid album, which I believe is called Now and Then. Then there's... Um, uh, she had a, a band called The Attaboys, so she was Freda and The Attaboys. You can listen to that album live at Cabell Hall, I believe, is is it? And then she had an album of lullabies also. Uh, so I followed in her footsteps in a couple of ways, I'm realizing now. Anyway, she's uh, if you get a chance to listen to her, I recommend her a lot. Um, so... I, I I feel like I learned this song maybe in college and then, you know, it, uh, forgot it existed for a very long time. Uh, but then when I was thinking about Apple songs, I was like, oh, this one it's comes, comes, comes back around. Um, and it was, it was fun to tap back into that. So it is possibly a folk song, I'm guessing. It sounds like a folk song. Although it could have been written by somebody. Please, if you know the author of this song, let me know. Um, But here it is on guitar. Do you love an apple? Do you love an apple? Do you love a pear? Do you love a laddie with curly brown hair? I love him, I can't deny him, I'll be with him wherever he goes. Before I got married, I'd wear a black shawl. Since I got married, I wear bugger all. Oh yes, I love him, I can't deny him. I'll be with him wherever he goes. He stood at the corner, a fag in his mouth, two hands in his pockets. He'd whistle me out, oh, but still, I love him. I can't deny him. I'll be with him wherever. the pier for nine bob a week come Saturday night he comes roaring home drunk oh but still I love him I can't deny him I'll be with him wherever he goes before I got married I'd sport and I'd play now the cradle it gets in my way oh but still i love him i can't deny him i'll be with him wherever he goes do you love an apple do you love a pear do you love a laddie with brown hair oh yes I love him I can't deny him 